Because it's yeah. Yes. So, you. Everything? Mm -hmm. No, this one is already open. Okay. Maybe move some. Okay. Well, you know this is better than me, so maybe you restart. Okay, shall we restart? Yes. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to start the next session and what I'm going to do is sort of go back to basics now. Um, the, the session we had before lunch on EdwinNet was supposed to be after this one but we had to swap things around. So just going back to, to basics here and we're going to start with a, an introduction to, to data management. Um, so, okay, so what I want... What I want to cover on this section is, um, first of all, defining what is what we're talking about, data and data management, um, then understanding the importance of um, managing data as part of your research, um, look at some of the data management risks within the, the research data life cycle, and understanding data within the context of that, that life cycle. So what we've got here is a definition of data. Well, there's there's many definitions of data. Just one that I picked out here. This is coming from the Australian National Data Service, and it talks about um, data is it's the data, the records, the files, and any other evidence, irrespective of their content or form. And these can be in print format, in digital, physical, or other forms um, that comprise research observations, findings, or outcomes. So this includes any primary material that you're collecting, plus any analysed data that you might have. So the National Science Foundation have come up with another a definition here, and, and they're saying that the, the data is, is determined by the community of interest through the process of peer review and project management. So in other words, it's saying that the it's the community of interest that's actually defining what data is. So the NSF is, is defined some different examples of data and that includes the data itself, it includes publications which might be the result of your research, it includes the samples, any physical collections, it can include the software and it includes models as well. So what is data management? Well first of all data management is any of the activities or practices that support the long-term preservation, access and use of data. So that covers the whole range there and it includes activities such as planning, documenting, formatting, storing, anonymizing data and controlling access to the data. So when we're dealing with data, we often talk about primary data and secondary data. So primary data is the, is the actual data that you collect in the field, for example, it's the factual data, it's the original data, whereas secondary data is an analysis or an interpretation of the primary data. And this, this uh, secondary data can include things like reports, conference papers, books, websites, etc. So why do we need to manage data? Well, data management helps the researchers do better research. So it helps you to optimize the data um, during the different phases of your research project. It helps you collaborate with other researchers. It also ensures that data is preserved for future researchers to be able to discover the data, interpret the data and reuse the data. So what this all does, it sustains 
the value of your data. Also, there's a number of funding agencies now are requiring um, good data management as part of your of, of research um, funding. Um, and they, they're doing this because they want to make sure that, uh, first of all, it provides transparency of your research project, and it also provides a, an increase in the return on the investment. So there's a lot of money is invested in your research, and they want to make sure that the data that you collect is going to be available um, for secondary analysis or for, for future innovations and use. So a lot of researchers now are requiring a data management plan as part of a proposal for research funding. Um, some of the stakeholders in, 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 uh, in data management. First of all, we've got the researchers, we've got institutions, um, publications. Oops, this is not going so well. So I'll just go through each of those stakeholders. First of all, we've got the primary researchers um, and the principal investigators. Now they're the people who design the study who specify what data is going to be collected, how it's going to be collected, um, and they analyze this data. Then there's the institutions. Now, the institutions can be a research institute or can be a university, and they set the data management policy. So all research institutions, all universities should have a data management policy. Um, the institutions also provide the, the resources for the researchers, and that, that can include things like data management training, support for um, researchers to write data management plans, and they can also provide services for archiving the data after the research. Then there's the data repositories. Now, these repositories can curate the data, ensure the long-term preservation of the data, and provide access to the data. Now, in some cases, a research institution or a university may not have the facilities to provide a data repository, so that could be another, another organisation, such as Emodnet, which we heard about before lunch. They provide a data repository, and then they, they provide access to the data through their portal. Some of the other stakeholders are the publishers and the, and the journals who disseminate the scientific dis uh, discovery. Um, they encourage researchers to cite their data, so any data that you use in your, for producing your research papers, you should also cite the data that you used in, in that research. The funders, well, obviously the funders providing the, provide the money for the, for the research project, um, and they require that the researchers manage their data properly. And, as I mentioned before, they require a data management plan for most project proposals. And then finally, we have the secondary users. These are the people that will use your data, who might verify the results of your, of your research, and they can also use the data for teaching. So within a research project, we have this, this data life cycle. And the, the, it's, it starts with, with, first of all, with creating data. And this thing starts. This is not working, I don't think. Okay, so it starts with creating data processing data, then there's the analysing the data, preserving the data, which is archiving the data, um, providing access to the data, and then finally reusing the data. So this is the whole cycle from the start when you collect the data, right through, the, right through to the, the end of the cycle is when you archive it and people reuse that data. So what we've just covered in this, this brief introduction is, first of all, defining what we mean by data and data management, um, understanding the importance of managing data, identifying the different data management tasks and this what we call the research life cycle, and understanding the, the data in the context of that research data life cycle.
So, do we have any any questions? Anybody want to make any comments on that? Is everybody fine with that? Good. So let's move on, and we want to cover now something about how you organise your data. We're going to talk about data organisation. We're going to talk about standards, and we're going to talk about things like file formats file naming conventions, folder structures, and vocabularies. These are all important aspects of managing your data. So what are some of the common errors that you find in data? First of all, date formats is a, is a very common error. Um, there's, people have different ways of, of formatting data. There's the, the American way of doing it with months, day, and year. There's the European way, day, month, year. There's also an international standard for defining date, which is why as is year, month, and day. But once again, if you don't define what is your your date format, then it's going to be confusing. Sometimes you can have uh, multiple representations. People use abbreviations, for example, and they may not be consistent, and therefore they can cause errors in the in the data. Uh, spelling errors. Often you'll find uh, people will spell things in a different way and we can overcome that by the use of control vocabularies. Units of measure are also important. You need to define what is your unit of measure and be consistent with that throughout the, the data set. Duplicate records is also another issue um, where the same piece of data appears more than once in a data set. And this can often happen when you combine data from different sources into a single data set. You might come up with duplication. So let's have a look at uh, file formats. I'm pretty sure you know what, what formats are. It's just a way that you structure data um, so machines can read it, so people can read it. And these formats apply not just to the data, but they apply to things like documents, images, audio files, video files, etc. When you're starting off on a research project, you should always decide before you start your project what file formats you're going to be using within your, within your research. You should decide on that and document that. Wherever possible, you should be using open formats. The reason for that is um, they're more likely to be readable into the future and they're much easier to share with other people. Um, sometimes you need to use proprietary formats. Well, that's fine if it's, if it's a well-known format, everybody uses it and there's, there's software out there that can, can read it. But the, the best option is to, to use an open format which doesn't require any proprietary software to, to read it. So some of the examples of formats for text files, you've got plain text or ASCII, you've got Microsoft PDF, rich text format, and HTML and XML. For numerical formats, you have things like Excel, and you also have some um, delimited text files. Multimedia uh, of images, you've got things like JPEG and PNG, etc. Also models and software. Uh, also another ex other examples. So why is it important to have um, certain file formats? Well first of all it allows you to manage your data much better. You know, you know what the format is when you know the data comes into your into the organization you know what the format is and you know what software what programs you need to to read that. Um, you need to make sure that um, that the formats that you decide on for your research project, there's going to be software available to read that and to manage that data. And you want to make sure that, or try to make sure at least, that your formats that you decide on today will be able to be read into the future. And that's more likely to happen if you choose a non-proprietary format and an open format. Um, using a standard representation such as ASCII, makes it a lot easier to, to manage uh, the formats, make sure they're unencrypted and uncompressed. 
So this is just a, a brief summary of the different categorizations of, of file formats. First of all, documents, you're probably familiar with these, PDFs, text documents, Word documents, etc. Um, these formats, such as um, Word and text documents, they're easily editable. PDF is not so easily edi uh, editable. In spreadsheets, you have things like Excel um, and other spreadsheets, such as Open Documents. And these types of formats, you can edit and change the data. With, with figures or images, um, they're not always easily um, editable. Um, if you're working with mapping data, uh, for example, for, for, for GIS, you can have things like Shapefile, which is a, which a proprietary format. But you can also have um, services such as WMS and WFS. Um, which you can use to manage the data. And finally, you can have compressed files, and you're probably all familiar with things like GZ and, and ZIP, for example, and these allow you to compress the files. So some of the challenges are there's many formats out there, but you need to find a, a format that's suitable for your own project, for the way you want to preserve your data, and the way you want to share that data and make it available into the future. Um, you need to decide whether you want to go down the path of a proprietary format or use um, open standards, both for your formats and, and for the software that might be, uh, might be used to access that data into the future. File format obsolescence is, is always an issue. Um, we often come across uh, situations where a format that was used maybe 10 years ago is no longer accessible for a number of reasons. And this could be because the, so uh, the software that's used to read the, the formats is no longer available. Um, sometimes software companies get bought out by another competitor and they no longer produce the software that you need to read your data. Um, Formats can f fall into disuse if nobody writes the software to support them anymore. Um, sometimes the, the software is not backwards compatible with older versions, so you then you're stuck with a format that you can't read. So the result of this obsolescence is that you may not be able to access the files in the future, you may not be able to read the data, um, and this is obviously going to be an issue. If you want to find out a little bit more about uh, file format obsolescence, there's a, there's a good reference there that provides an overview of the different uh, formats and, and, and software. So one way of resolving this obsolescence problem is, is data migration. So you need to make sure that the, the data is always stored in a format that's, um, that's current. So if, if, you're, if you've got software that's about to become obsolete, for example, you need to migrate it to a, a more suitable format. If you don't do this, the, the other option is to preserve the whole environment. In other words, you need to maintain an old computer system, hardware, software, operating system, um, or write some emulation software. Now that's, that's a lot of work and it's not really necessary if you if you keep your formats current with the 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 software that you're using. So we have these the, the two options here. We have open formats and we have proprietary formats. So proprietary formats are owned by a corporation, for example. Uh, they're closed. <coughs> Um, or they're not the, the definitions are not available to the to the public. Data that's stored in a proprietary format can usually only be accessed by the, the proprietary software, and you may need a license. You need to buy a license to actually use the to read a file. Open formats, on the other hand, um, the the formats are published. They're 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 open to the for people to write software, um, to read and write those formats. And some examples, I've just mentioned here a few uh, open formats for image uh, formats, for documents, uh, for the web. And NetCDF is probably the most common 
format that we use for scientific data. Is everybody familiar with NetCDF as a format? So that's an open format which is commonly used for scientific data. I'll just show you this little video here which talks about choosing the right format for open data. It's going to work. Huh? How do I turn it on? I'm Dave Tarrant, I'm the trainer and data scientist here at the Open Data Institute. So the format of open data refers to how that data is made available and understandable for both humans and machines. And as well as considering the format, it's also critical to consider the structure of the data and also how it is delivered to the users. So choosing the right format is critical to maintain the usability and the access. And there are three main characteristics. You choose the format, the structure and its delivery mechanism. So when choosing the format, the most reusable format is likely to be that in which it is already managed and used. This will be closest to that context in how it's used currently. But this format might not be the most widely available, widely understood. So it may be necessary to publish in a format like CSV in addition to that other format. So as you can see, you should also consider publishing in a number of different formats and also be prepared for any particular format's obsolescence. When it comes to the structure, there are several different structures that data can exist in. Okay, so the most common one, again, is tabular, where you've got things in rows and columns. This is used for things like expenses data. But there's also hierarchical data that represents relationships between people, so think of your family tree. And there is also network data, which is very hard to think of in terms of a file format. But this represents the links, such as those between your friends on Facebook. They can go in any direction. And finally, you need to consider the delivery mechanism. So do you make it available as a file download? And if you do, you should carefully consider the size so that it's easy to download quickly and it's not going to take a long time. The frequency at which it's updated, so it doesn't need to be updated for you regularly, monthly. Uh, and also the terminology that you use to make that understandable. You should also consider if the data is more live, like transport data, that it might be more wise to provide a machine-readable feed of that data and that would be more appropriate than a file-based delivery. So we encourage the broadest range of formats, structures and delivery mechanisms of data to be used. But core to all of these is the CSV format, the most commonly used open data format online. Beyond CSV, when deciding other formats, structures and delivery mechanisms, it is critical to engage users and for users to engage providers of data. This saves both parties a lot of time. Okay, so that was just a brief introduction to the um, open data formats. And what he mentioned there was probably one of the most important open data formats, and that's CSV, comma separated values. Probably everybody's familiar with CSV. Um, it's just uh, it's uh, like a spreadsheet, but it's it's not in Excel format. It's it's a, a tabular data and it's, sa it's saved in an open format, um, which is machine readable, open, and anybody can import it into other, into other software. So CSVs, what they call the lowest common denominator for open data, and if you're providing your data to, to other um, collaborators, to other researchers, CSV is a good way to go, because even with Excel, there's different versions of Excel and different um, um, different versions of the software, so even an Excel spreadsheet is not always the best way to go. And also, if, if you're using, for example, a GIS software, it's very easy to import your data in if it's in CSV format, so it's very transportable and um, easy to use. So I just mentioned um, geospatial formats. Um, sometimes these are 
these are more complex. Obviously, we have things like um, hierarchical data sets. We have um, network data sets. So they're a little more complex than the straight um, um, Excel or CSV file. So when you're publishing geospatial data, once again, you should use an open format such as uh, GeoJSON or KML, for example. And these formats are specifically designed um, to be used within a within a GIS environment, and they're very easy um, to import and export, and used for specialist mapping tools such as OpenStreetMaps. Um, so file formats are essential if you want to share your data. Um, some disciplines have um, mandatory or, or standard formats that they that they use. If that's the case, you need to know what they are, and you need to be using those those uh, formats, whether for sa saving the data or for storing storing the data. Um, using appropriate file formats ensures the sustainability of your data and make sure that people can access it and reuse it in the future. Migrating from one unsuitable format to a more sustainable format is, is often difficult. It's, it can be expensive and in some cases if you're converting from one format to another you may actually lose data during that conversion process. So that's something you need to be aware of. If you want to find out more about file formats, there's a number of um, references, references there that you can go and have a look at. It talks about the different file formats and digital preservation and things like that. Obsolescence of uh, file formats as well. So now I just want to have a look at um, file and folder naming. This is how you actually name your files and name the, the folders where you're going to store your data. This is another very important aspect of, of uh, managing your data. So file naming makes it easy to identify and locate and retrieve your data both now and into the future. You, you should have a, a logical and clear file naming system um, and you need to make sure that you understand it, your colleagues within your project understand it. Um, and um, there's not there may not be just one recommended way to name your files and folders, but you need to come up with a system for your project, for example, for your research, where you're going to consistently file, uh, name your files and your folders, and that should be used throughout your project. So decide on this, this file and folder naming system, discuss it with your colleagues, and it's a good idea to document it as well. So you, you need to choose logical and consistent ways of naming and organizing your files. Decide on the, the, uh, the way you're going to do that before the start of your project. And make sure that you've, you, the naming convention is consistent, it's meaningful to you and your colleagues, um, it allows you to easily find your files. Um, so once you come up with this agreed naming convention, it's going to help you in the future. It's going to help you to easily find um, your files. It's going to um, prevent things like version control when you have multiple uh, files, for example. And uh, in the long run, this is going to prevent errors within your research. So some of the elements of a, of a, pro, of a file name, for example, you should use maybe a vocabulary is a standard vocabulary that you could use for naming your files. Uh, punctuation is important. You're going to use capitals or you're not going to use capitals. You're going to use hyphens or underscores. All these things are things that you need to discuss and agree within your project. Agree on a date format, which, um, and it's, it's always useful to uh, name your files starting with a, with a date format, and that way you can you can sort them chronologically in order. Um, numbers, how are you going to use numbers? You're going to use 01 or 001, things like that. These are pretty basic things that you need to talk about and discuss within your project and then decide on what is the, the conventions that you're going to use. So um, 
by coming up with a with a, a standard convention is going to help you stay organized within your project. Um, it allows you to identify the files that contain the information you're looking for. It's going to help others to understand the data and to navigate through your, your work as well. Um, so naming documents in a logical, intuitive way ensures that you and your, your collaborators can discover, manage, access um, the, the data and the documents when you need them. So here's, a, here's an example here, some examples here. On the, on the left hand side we have uh, file names without a naming convention. So we have things like test data 2013, project data, design for project, lab work, second test, all these things, what do they mean? They might mean something to you, but they don't mean, they may not mean anything to other people. So on the right hand side, we've, we've come up with a convention, and I'm not saying this is the convention you should use, but this is just an example of a convention where the file name starts with the date, and they're using the year, month, day format. The second part of the file name is the project, so this is the D, uh, whatever the name of your project is and then you start with the actual what's inside the file for example it could be um, exercise one test documentation exercise two test documentation things like that project management notes so this way we have a, a convention for naming your files and you use that convention throughout your research project then all your, all your files will be named in a similar way and they're going to be much easier to find in the future. And by calling your files lab work, or Eric, or something like that, that means nothing to anybody else except maybe yourself. And even, I reckon, after th two or three weeks, you've probably forgotten yourself what lab work Eric meant. So come up with a, with a um, convention for naming your files and try to stick with it. So some of the rules um, give as much detail as possible. We're not restricted to short file names anymore. Um, use include something like a data parameter. Um, uh, use lowercase letters, for example. Use an underscore or hyphen. Don't use a space. And the reason for that is certain operating systems don't like spaces in file names. Don't use special characters. Um, However, if you're getting data from another project, for example, who has a file naming convention, you don't change it. So in Modus is a good example. The files that you get from Modus uh, have a file naming convention, which includes the date, the time, position, things like that. If you're getting data from other people, don't change their file names because they've the, um, because they're following a convention of their own. So in our marine data, when we're, we're um, describing our data files, use things like, if you want to describe the parameter or object within the file, use things like temperature, salinity, whatever. We've got air temperature, phosphate, current, whatever. Include that in the name of your file. Um, the example here, if you have multiple entries, indicate like air temperature underscore relative humidity wind velocity. Um, if, if it's an image file or a grid file, you may want to include that within your, your file name. Date and time. So you want to include a date or a time. I would suggest if you're going to put dates, use the ISO standard format, which is year, month and day. Um, you can include things like depths and heights. For example, if it's a if it's a hundred meters or five hundred meter depth data, you can include that in your file name. Location. You might even want to put the location in if it's um, the the continent, the country, the project name, whatever it is. If it's a particular program or a project that you're working on, include that in the file name. So these are just some examples of how you can name your data files. Now this is some examples. I don't know if anybody can would like to guess what these uh, what this file name is. Any ideas? Yep. 
Yep. Annual value based Yeah. Global. Yeah. Uh, world, global That's the World Ocean Atlas. Yeah. yeah. Ingrid is the is the provider, and NC because it's a net CDF file. Um, that's a, a as I said a common file. And and these are just some examples here. You've got chlorophyll in this in this particular example. JFM, January, February, March. So you don't put things like summer or winter, because what does that mean? Summer for me means doesn't mean summer for you guys. So, so put the months, for example. So these are just some examples of, of names of, of files. Another way to organize your files is have a, have a proper folder structure. So when you, you're going to get different files in as part of your research, you'll be getting files um, which obviously need to be documented and named the way we talk it, talked about it, but you also need to manage those files within some sort of a folder structure. So you need to design a structure for your project, for the different types of data that's, that you're going to be collecting, and work out what is the structure for, the, for your uh, files. So as I said here, there's no right way or there's no wrong way, but you need to come up with uh, a system that's going to be scalable and it's going to be consistent. Um, so you're going to get many files coming in through your research project. Some, some will, and then you, your raw data, your original data might be then processed or um, turned into products. And these are all different files that you'll be creating. So by having a standard folder structure, then you can then organize your data files a lot better. Um, folder names should once again be named after the project or the research that you're doing. Um, and use folder names that uniquely describe your files. And don't use names that are meaningless or mean only something to you. Once again, this is something you need to discuss within your project and come up with a, a standard way of naming your folders. Now this is an example folder structure and we'll be talking more about this probably tomorrow. Lika, you'll be going into this or? Yeah. So we'll be talking about more of this tomorrow, but this is a standard structure that we uh, came up with for our, our data management training. And you can see here at the top, we have the name of the project and under that we have subfolders, one folder here for data, one folder here for metadata and for one on one for products. And under the data folder we have things like base maps, oceans, and this is obviously up to you how you're going to do that. For the products we have things, and this is dependent on the software that we're going to use. For example, Ocean Data View, we have a folder for Ocean Data View. So the, the analyze, analysis of the data, the products, Ocean Data View are stored within this structure. And so when you want to come back in a few weeks' time or a few months' time and you're looking for the ODV file that you created for the data, you know where to look for it. So this is just a, a structure, and we're going to be working on this tomorrow, a similar sort of a structure for your the work that you're going to do with ODV and with, with Saga. And finally, what I want to talk about is control vocabularies. Um, so what is, a, what is a vocabulary? First of all, it's a, a set of terms or labels. And these could be words, they could be codes, um, and they're used usually by a specific community to represent certain concepts. So what a vocabulary does, it sets out the common language um, that's used in a particular discipline to refer to um, the concept of interest within that discipline. So they can, they can take many forms. They can include things like glossaries, dictionaries, gazetteers, code lists, taxonomies, etc. So there's different forms of, of vocabularies. Um, so some of the specific types we have a thesaurus, which is a, a more structured kind of, of control vocabulary. Taxonomy, which is a hierarchical classification, uh, which is used in the, mainly in, in uh, biology. 
uh, we have ontologies, which is a which is another set of concepts and attributes and relationships, uh, which have meanings, and these meanings are defined, and they're they're documented. So there's there's currently a project going on called ODIP. Anybody heard of ODIP, the Ocean Data Interoperability Program? It's a it's a data management project with partners from the EU, from the US and from Australia. And what they're doing is they're basically, um, they want to share data across um, specific domains and across international boundaries. And one of the outcomes of this project is the development and implementation of standards for common vocabularies. So these vocabularies are now being used across these different um, project participants and um, and another another example here is the NERC vocabulary server. Those of you um, working on the C Data Net project, who's that? Who's working on C Data Net? So you you must be aware of the NERC vocabulary server because that's the vocabulary that's the the standard vocabularies that are being used by C Data Net for the the C Data Net partners. And the, the NERC vocabulary server includes descriptions of data, platforms, instruments, geographic locations, and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail shortly. So why do we want to have control uh, vocabularies? Well, they're important because, first of all, um, we have um, a vocabulary that's accepted by the community of practice. So, for example, the NERC... Um, vocabulary server which was set up by the CDataNet project and it's agreed to by that whole community, European community, that's working on CDataNet. They're also, they're defined, so the terms are precisely characterized, in other words they have rigorous definitions which are, which are documented and they rarely change. And thirdly they're managed, so there needs to be a body of experts who maintain these these vocabularies, um, control vocabularies, and this maintenance includes periodic reviews, addition of new terms, modification of terms, and occasionally deprecation of terms. So, for example, with the NERC vocabulary server, there is a community out there, and somebody might say, "Oh, I would like to add a new term to this vocabulary," and they'll come up with a reason why they want it. Uh, a definition, and then the community will discuss it, and then they will, in some cases, they'll agree, or they'll say, no, you should be using this term or that term. So this is a whole community that, that maintains this um, control vocabulary, and um, it's well documented and well used. So the benefits, first of all, clarification and specification of the language and terms that are being used standardization of the terms, um, discoverability is enhanced because everybody's using the same terminologies, and it's consistent over a whole range of data sets across organizations. So the alternative to not having a control vocabulary is just using your plain text, plain language text. And this can be subject to errors in spelling, for example. People might misspell a term um, they may, what we call entity abuse, where they call, uh, they put an instrument, describe an instrument in a parameter field, for example. Now these things are going to be, cause problems when you're searching for data. So if, you, if you're searching for a data that's spelled this way, depending on your search engine, you may not come up with any results when this is the, the correct way of spelling it. So by having a controlled vocabulary, all these things are agreed to beforehand. And so for when you're searching for data, it makes it a lot easier. So one way of, of making a vocabulary available to the community is to set up a vocabulary service. Um, and this is a machine-to-machine -machine service that supports activities such as creating uh, and managing and querying the vocabularies. Um, in a control vocabulary, you can represent the the vocabulary using a simple knowledge organization system or SCOS, 
which is a standard way to represent knowledge organisations using RDF, which is um, the, the format that, that's used. So this means that the vocabulary information can be passed between computer applications and it's completely interoperable. So these are some examples here of control vocabularies. There's um, CDataNet has control vocabularies. They have a CDataNet pr uh, parameter disciplines. Uh, in Australia, there's the Australian Ocean Data Network has some vocabularies for organisations and platforms. And in the US, they have the GCMD, the Global Change Master Directory, which has um, some scientific keywords, which is also a, is a control vocabulary. So if you want to implement a control a vocabulary for your own project, so you, you've got a research project and you want to come up with a, a control vocabulary, there's two ways you can do it. You can use an existing vocabulary, and as I pointed out, some examples there. There's, there's, a, there's vocabularies that cover a whole lot of um, different disciplines and different research areas. Or alternatively, you can build your own. And from my personal experience, I would certainly recommend that you do not build your own. There's a lot of work in, first of all, defining it. Then you need to maintain it. You need to have a community that's going to use it. Why would you do that when somebody else has done all the work for you? They've developed the vocabulary, they've maintained it, they've documented it. So find something that's going to meet your own needs and don't start building your own. So when you want to implement a control vocabulary for your, for your project, choose one, choose one that's out there. There's many to choose from. Um, Find, uh, find one that's going to suit your project. And I mentioned C, for, for Europe anyway, CData, CDataNet would be the place to go and choose one of their vocabularies that they've used. Uh, then you need to implement it. So you need to, there's different ways you can implement it. If you have a metadata system, for example, you can have drop down lists or you can have, um, that's a sort of a, probably an old fashioned way of doing things like that. But these, way, th these days you, you need to have a, such as a, a vocabulary service and we'll, I'll show you the C data net one shortly. And then, then you need to map, your, uh, map the control vocabularies to the work that you're doing. So that's the, the way that you, you could do it. So just to summarize what we just covered here is that we've talked about um, how to organize and manage your research data. Um, first thing to do before you start your research is decide on what standards you're going to use, decide on what for, uh, file formats you're going to use, wherever possible use open formats uh, for your data, and design, and design how your data is going to be named and how it's going to be organized. Um, you need to come up with a naming scheme that's descriptive, that's unique, that reflects the content of your research. Um, and all of this should be done before you actually start collecting data. Use control vocabularies to provide a standardization uh, for discovery of data as well as for documenting the data. So all of these things, they're, they're important to discuss within your, within your project discuss with the collaborators and come up with an agreed standards or formats that you're going to be using within your project. So that's about it. Has anybody got any questions? Any comments? Yes. When uh, people do like a data papers, um, all of this has to be reflected in that data paper? You mean a research paper? Yes. Uh, but basically to publish in terms of um, share with the communities that you have a set of data that can be free available and then obviously has particular format or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, that would be part, part of documenting your data is to write the metadata, right? So the metadata is a description of your data set. So within the metadata, it will have things like, it will describe what, does, what is a file format, what is a vocabularies that you're using, 
for example. So that would all be described within the metadata. Yeah. Okay, any other questions there? Yep. That's about it, because it's a it's a format. It's like a like an XML format, which allows you to describe your data, so it can be displayed on Google Earth. And there's a lot of applications now that other applications that are being written, which will read KML. And your GIS software is some examples. They will read KML directly into the GIS net, GIS software now, because it's like, it's an open it's, it's an open format. It's um, so you can write some software today to read a KML file into your application, or whatever it might be. So it's just why it's just. A, well, shapes different because shapes are proprietary format. It's an Esri format, although a lot of software now can read shapes because I think Esri is probably I think they've published actually documented the format. But it, it's still a proprietary format, whereas um, other formats are, are more open, I guess. All right. So, so what I want you to do now is show us how much you've learnt from this last 45 minutes. There's a quiz here. So if you could have a, a go at doing that quiz, answer the questions, and probably 15 minutes should be enough. If you finish earlier, we've got another assignment we can do as well.